for scene one, we are going to see the witches again. So if we go and just remove and discard Middleton's scene, because let's face it, they were those were not our witches. That was not, that's not part of the play whatsoever. So let's just pretend that that didn't happen. So if we pretend that that didn't happen, this is now going to be the third time the witches are seen within the play. So the number three was thought to be very important as far as numbers go, because it was thought to carry mystical powers, Ooh, which is very exciting. And so Shakespeare is gonna be using this number to underline the supernatural themes of the play. So number three has mystical power. And even in writing, that is called the power of three. Um, so I don't know, even in our everyday type of thing, we have, we, we still like put number three up on top of the, the podium there. So let's go ahead and get started. Act four, scene one, and we're back with my favorite characters, the witches. Act four, scene one. A cave with a fiery pit in it. In this sits a boiling cauldron. From the flames rise the three witches. Thrice the brinded cat hath mewed. Thrice and once the hedge pig whined. Harpia cries, tis time, tis time. Round about the cauldron go, in the poisoned entrails throw. Toad that under cold stone Days and nights has thirty-one Sweltered venom sleeping got Boil thou first i' the charmed pot Double, double, double toil and trouble Fire burn and cauldron bubble I don't know about y'all, but I do not want to eat whatever they are going to be throwing into this cauldron. Just saying. So the ingredients that are going into the pot are going to be associated with evil or the night. So we have very sad thing that starts out first. A little tabby ginger cat is going into the cauldron. It's very upsetting. Y'all know how much I love my kitties. Then a little hedgehog. I'm kind of sad about the hedgehog too. The little hedgy, not the hedgehog. Not little Sonic. I'm sorry, I saw my, my chance and I took it. And then a toad that was kept under a rock for a month because they thought that um, it would be more poisonous the longer it was kept under a rock. Where do people come up with this? I don't know. And then I'm sure that you guys have heard the double, do double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Well, Shakespeare created that. Hey, now you guys know, it's so great. So let's see what else they're gonna go and put into this um, very interesting mixture. Oh. Fillet of a fenny snake in the cauldron boil and bake. Eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog, adder's fork and blind worm's sting, lizard's leg and howlet's wing. For a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth, boil and bubble. Toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Scale of dragon, tooth of wolf, witch's mummy, moor and gulf of the ravined salt sea shark, root of hemlock, digged in the dark. Liver of blaspheming Jew, gall of goat, and slips 
of you slivered in the moon's eclipse, nose of Turk and Tartar's lips, finger of birth strangled babe, ditch delivered by a drab, make the gruel thick. A baboon's blood, then the charm is firm and good. Well, that's a mix. Yes, they did. Okay, so let's go through some of the things that were just put into this cauldron. So we have a dragon scale. Okay, I can see that one. A wolf's tooth. Then it says witch's mummy ma in gulf of the ravished sea salt shark. So we have the witch's mummy. That was wax that they would stick pins into. So think of kind of like a voodoo doll, like to just to give you a little mental image there. So the ma and gulf are going to be um, a stomach and a throat. Okay, of the, of the raven sea salt sea shark. And that shark reference is included because what don't sharks do? They don't sleep. Oh, who does that sound like? Um, yes. So that is, and they're also known as killing machines, right? You know, so that reference is to go and reference Macbeth there, which is kind of cool. Um, the gall of goat represents lust and the reproductive tract. I don't know why. I don't know who was like looking at a goat's like gallbladder and was just like, yes, this is what that's going to represent. I have no idea, but that's what they believed. And so I'm just passing along that information. Um, Let's see here, the liver of a blaspheming Jew. Okay, that's disturbing. Um, but they have that in order to go and associate with the killing of Christ, because remember, everyone, pretty much everyone who's sitting in Shakespeare's theater at the Globe in the 1600s was going to be a, a Christian. Therefore, that's going to be like, oh, okay, we don't like them, you know, so it's, it's just to go and like, put the, the witches away from them, be like, oh, they're not to make them all that likable. Um, now I just kind of look at it and be like, oh, that's not cool. Um, let's see here, what else? Slivered in the, oh, excuse me, the gall of goat and slips of you slivered in the moon's eclipse. So you, not Y-O-U, but Y-E-W, it grows in graveyards. And so people believed that if they slice them off during a lunar eclipse, it made it more powerful. Okay, yeah, yeah. And then nose of Turk and Tartar's lips. Um, so that would be a person from Turkey and also a person from Africa, their lips and nose. So that's kind of gross. Um, yeah, it's very not cool, but you have to remember the time period. We're in, well, Shakespeare was in England remember that that's an island in Europe. People didn't travel all that much. You know, like some people had, that was their job and they did travel and then it wouldn't be all that like quote unquote exotic and different. Um, but for people who mainly lived in England and worked, lived and worked in England, Turkey and Africa were going to be seen as like super exotic and like really far away. And so they'd be like, oh, how they get that? Then, wow. <laughs> And then the, the part that pretty much everybody always notices very quickly 
is the finger of a birth strangled babe ditch delivered by a drab. Um, yeah, so that is a, a dead baby's finger, unfortunately. Um, but that's gonna go and relate back to that theme of child abuse. So we have that yet again established. So what they're talking about with a drab, a drab is going to be a prostitute, okay? So it would be a prostitute who gave birth to a baby in a ditch and then strangled said baby. Um, yeah, that's, that's really sad. And then left the body behind. So the witches did not kill the baby. It was the, the prostitute mother which is again, very upsetting. So the witches came and snapped the baby's finger off in, in order to add to the potion, which is also not cool and extremely gross. Okay. Oh, gosh. Oh, that's sad. I mean, I always, especially for this time period, uh, the prostitute would not be able to go and take care of the baby. Um, not, not that it excuses it whatsoever, but I, I do feel empathy for this fictitious prostitute mother. Um, but again, you would hope that she would go and find a, a family. Right. Right. Yeah, so that was that reference is definitely to go and make people be taken aback. And obviously it does. Um, and then they go and cool the, uh, the potion. I don't, I don't know exactly know what to call it. Um, they cool it with baboon's blood and then it's all, it's ready. Yeah. So this next portion is going to seem more like a Midsummer Night's Dream. It doesn't fit here um, because all of a sudden Hecate's going to come on back in and there's going to be some music. There's going to be some elves. And Hecate's not speaking in the same meter as the witches just were. Um, interestingly enough, it's gonna be the same music that was in Middleton's play. So it just, it doesn't fit. So we'll go and, and see that here in a second. Enter Hecate with three other witches. Oh, well done. I commend your pains, and everyone shall share in the games. And now about the cauldron sing, like elves and fairies in a ring, enchanting all that you put in. They sing and dance, then Hecate and her three witches leave. Bright spirits and white, red spirits and white. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Open locks, whoever knocks. Something wicked this way comes. Who do you think is coming? Macbeth, yeah. <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> so anytime you hear, like sometimes people will be like, oh, something wicked this way comes. You never want to be the person that they're referring to because then they're like alluding that you're like Macbeth and you don't want to be like Macbeth. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, you know that he's done some really terrible things if these witches are like, whoa, here comes the wicked guy. I mean, look at what they just put in that cauldron and they're just like, oh, someone really bad's coming. <laughs> <laughs> so remember that at the end of Act 3, he had 
said that he was going to go and visit the witches. Um, and so here he is. Let's see what he has to say. Macbeth enters the cave. How now, you secret black and midnight hags? What is you do? A deed without a name. I conjure you by that which you profess. However you come to know it, answer me. Though you untie the winds and let them fight against the churches, though the yeasty waves confound and swallow navigation up, though Bladed corn be lodged and trees blown down, though castles topple on their warders' heads, though palaces and pyramids do slope their heads to their foundations, though the treasure of nature's Germans tumble altogether even till destruction sicken, answer me to what I ask you. Okay, I know he's the king. But that was really rude to just come on in there and be like, how now, you secret black and midnight hags? That's rude, you know? And then he's just like, I have come here and you are going to tell me everything that I want to know. Not even a, like, hi, how are you? Not nothing. He doesn't. And then he's just like, I don't care what happens in the future or to the rest of the world, as long as I get my way. He does need to work on his greetings. He, yeah, he's he's like super cranky and I, I don't appreciate this. You know, I feel like, yes, the witches have done some things that, you know, like the rump fed Runyon's husband, it's not okay of the things that they have done, but still let's, Macbeth, calm down, sir. You know, that's just, be respectful, you know? So he then says that he doesn't care like about how bad nature makes the world. He just wants to know what he wants to know. And pretty much throws his hands up to everybody else and everything else in the world. As long as he gets his way, he doesn't care. Well then. You know, if I were one of the witches, I'd just be like, no, you need a timeout, sir. No. Yes, go, go think, go, let's go reflect upon your tone. And then when you can actually speak to me in a normal manner that is not rude, then we'll talk. <laughs> so let's see what the witches have to say. Oh, this isn't going to go well. Speak. Demand. We'll answer. Say if that'd rather hear it from our mouths or from our masters. Call him. Let me see him. Pour in sow's blood that hath eaten her nine pharaoh. Grease that sweaten from the murderer's gibbet throw into the flame. Come high or low, thyself and office deftly show. Now I cut it off like right at a super dramatic point, sorry. So they're just like, oh, okay. Uh, do you want to hear it from us or do you want to hear it from someone else? Like our masters. And he's like, bring it, bring them on. I'm not scared. Wrong thing to say to the witches. Wrong thing, sir. So they um, then go and pour in some sow's blood. So a sow is going to be a female pig. And she ate her nine piglets. Now I do have to say piglets, or not piglets, excuse me. Pigs are disgusting. Like I love pigs, don't get me wrong. I, I absolutely love like the little tails and the little oinks and everything like that. However, my best friend from college grew up on a pig farm and he was just like he one night he's like you want to come see the piglets and i'm like yes i learned so much about pigs that night mm -mm. they are insanely intelligent but you know what they're like the the animal form of macbeth they will kill and eat anything Oof. Yeah, it'd be a pig farm. 
Yeah. There is in a stench. Oh my goodness. Oh, just the memory of that is so gross. Anyway, so uh, the nine, nine is going to be an important number because it's divisible by three. So we have that three in here again. Okay. So let's, an apparition is going to appear. <laughs> From the cauldron now rises the first apparition. A severed head with full armor on. Tell me, thou unknown power. He knows thy thought. Hear his speech, but say thou naught. So Macbeth, this is going to be really important. So Macbeth is like, okay, tell me severed head. And the first witch, she's like, D -d 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 -d, stop talking. He knows what you want. Don't talk. Just listen. Now, do you think Macbeth is going to listen to that? No, that's not going to go too well. Let's see what the apparition has to say. Macbeth! 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 Beware Macduff! Beware the Thane of Fife! Dismiss me. Enough. The head sinks back into the boiling cauldron. That was the scariest voice I've ever heard in my life. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh. 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 Anyway, the first apparition says, Macbeth. Anyway, sorry, I had to. I had to. I'm sorry. <laughs> The first apparition after his creepy hello to Macbeth says to beware Macduff. So that is the first apparition. He says, beware Macduff. And he says, dismiss me enough. Okay, that, that's pretty straightforward. Whatever thou art, for thy good caution, thanks. Thou hast harped my fear aright, but one word more. He will not be commanded. Here's another more potent than the first. So of course Macbeth doesn't listen. He's like, yeah, I, I knew it. I knew Macduff wasn't to be trusted. He's like, um, wait, I, I need to talk to you a little bit more. And the, the witch is like, no, we told you, don't talk, listen. Listen. Yes, use your ears, not your mouth. <laughs> so now we're going to have the second apparition up here. From the seething cauldron, a child covered in blood rises. Macbeth. 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 Had I three ears, I'd hear thee. Be bloody, bold, and resolute. Laugh to scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. The bloody child sinks back into the cauldron. That's creepy, isn't it? Oh, you're liking it? You're loving it? Okay, so a bloody child. Ugh. Ugh. rises from the cauldron. Ugh. That just gives me like such the heebie-jeebies on so many levels. I don't know why. And he says, okay, Macbeth, be bloody, bold, and resolute. Laugh to scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. Well, I mean, Everyone's born from a woman at this time period, right? You know, it'd be so it's pretty much saying that no one can kill him or harm him. That's pretty cool. Okay. Okay. See how Macbeth reacts to that. <laughs> then live Macduff. What need I fear of thee? But yet I'll make assurance double sure and take a bond of fate. Thou shalt not live that I may tell. Pale-hearted fear, it lies. 
and sleep in spite of thunder. So he's like, yeah. I'm invincible. Yeah. So if he is invincible, then Macduff's not a threat, you know? So Macbeth decides to let him live, but then he changes his mind. He's like, nah, I'm just going to be doubly sure for my own safety. And then he's like, I hope that with Macduff dead, it'll be finally enough to end all of the killing and that he can finally get some sleep even through like a thunderstorm. So remember, he hasn't fully slept since he murdered Duncan. Oof. So now we have the third apparition, another child. It's going to be coming out. Now from the cauldron rises a child wearing a crown and with a tree in his hand. What is this? that arises like the issue of a king and wears upon his baby brow the round and top of sovereignty. Listen, but speak not to it. Be lion-mettled, proud, and take no care who chafes, who frets, or where conspirers are. Macbeth shall never vanquished be until Great Burnham Wood to High Dunsinane Hill shall come against him. The third apparition sinks back into the boiling waters. Okay, so the third one says to be brave like a lion and that Macbeth shouldn't worry about plots against him because he cannot be beaten. And the only way that he could go and be beaten is if Burnham Wood, which is like a forest, it would go and need to uproot itself. So trees would have to go and uproot themselves and physically come to Dunsinane Castle in order to beat Macbeth. I don't know about y'all, but like last time I checked, trees don't do that, right? You know, like trees aren't just like, hold on one moment <laughs> and just like uproot themselves and you see like some roots just walking yeah trees have free will so i mean Macbeth really shouldn't worry because <laughs> okay yeah forest is gonna come to a castle okay that's just weird like yeah that's just weird <laughs> that will never be who can impress the forest? Bid the tree unfix his earthbound root. Sweet Boldman's good. The rebellious dead never rise till the wood of Burnham and a high-placed Macbeth shall live the lease of nature. Pay his breath to time and mortal custom. So Macbeth is feeling pretty confident, as he should. Because no one can go and make trees move. I mean, unless it's like, like a tornado. Oh my gosh, what if a tornado comes? <gasps> oh, anyway, I think no one's going to be like fighting at that point if a tornado is coming. I don't even know. Does England get tornadoes? I don't know. Someone fact check me and let me know. <laughs> I don't know. So then he is not going to be just satisfied hearing this stuff because remember the original predictions that Banquo's children would one day become kings so that's going to be like preying on his mind here so let's see if he ha what he has to say yet my heart throbs to know one thing tell me if your art can tell so much shall Banquo's issue ever reign in this kingdom seek to know no more i will be satisfied deny me this and an eternal curse fall on you let me know why sinks that cauldron what noise is this so this is now the third time that the witches have warned Macbeth to not ask for more and then he has a little tantrum and then curses them. <laughs> That's just, he 
He's seriously threatening these witches. Like, that is such a bad idea. Bad move, Minkbath. Oh, no, they definitely don't care about him. Absolutely not. So they are now just going to be like, oh, you want to know? Okay, let us show you what's going to happen. This is not going to go well. And I love it. I was like, wait, wait, why sing that cauldron? What, what noise is this? Well, you asked for it, Macbeth. I'm sorry, but there are consequences, sir. Let's see what those consequences are. Show, show, show. Show, show his, his eyes, eyes and, and grieve his, his heart. heart. Come, Come like shadows, so depart. depart. Macbeth sees a line of eight kings crossing the stage. Banquo enters last. Thou art too like the spirit of Banquo! Down! Thy crown does sear mine eyeballs! And thy hair, thou other gold-bound brow, is like the first. A third is like the former. Filthy hags! Why do you show me this? Fourth, start eyes. What will the line stretch out to the crack of doom? Another, yet seventh. I'll say no more. And yet the eighth appears, who bears a glass which shows me many more. And some I see the twofold balls and treble scepters carry. Horrible sight! Now I see it is true. For the blood bolted Banquo smiles on me and points at them for his. What is this soul? Ah, Macbeth. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's mean of me. So the eight kings are going to represent the eight Stuart kings of Scotland. And the eighth king that appears is supposed to represent King James I of England. Remember the guy who made Shakespeare rewrite the first draft of Macbeth? And he's holding a mirror in his hand to symbolize that there will be an infinite number of his descendants after him. So like, you know that King James I is sitting in the, in the audience. He's like, yeah, what's up? That's my line. How's it going? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I mean, and I mean, the witches are totally punishing Macbeth for his rudeness, you know? And so they are showing him his worst fear coming true. That Banquo, even though he's dead, is going to be the ultimate victor. So James I, you know that he's just sitting in the audience. He's like, yeah, <laughs> this is me. It's my family tree right there. And he's just loving it. He's absolutely loving this. <laughs> I sir, all this is so. But why stands Macbeth thus amazedly? Come, sisters. Cheer we up his sprites, and show the best of our delights. I'll charm the air to give a sound, while you perform your antic round. That this great king may kindly say, our duties did his welcome pay. The witches dance around him, and then vanish. Black spirits and white, black spirits and white, red spirits and white, red spirits and white, Okay, so they just went and punished Macbeth. And then they're like, oh, he feels bad. Let's go dance and sing for him to make him feel better. Was this written by Shakespeare, this part? No. 
not at all. So we have one last little bit of Middleton thrown in there. At least Hecate, uh, well, I, it does say the witches dance and then vanish with Hecate. So I, apparently Hecate was just like chilling in the background. She just like pops up for a little, a little cameo of like, it's my dance moves, hey. <laughs> <laughs> but they do disappear and now we're back to the real Macbeth. Usually anytime that you have this singing and dancing, producers go and cut this because that's not, it's just not the play. Where are they? Gone. Let this pernicious hour stand a accursed in the calendar. Come in! Without there! Lennox enters. What's your grace's will? Saw you the weird sisters? No, my lord. Came they not by you? No, indeed, my lord. Infected be the air whereon they ride, and damned all those that trust them. I did hear the galloping of horse. Who else came by? So he's like, oh, Lennox, did you see the witches? And he's like, what? No. Uh, did you see some witches, Macbeth? And he's like, oh, they didn't walk past you? And he's like, no, dude, no. So then Macbeth says, infected be the air whereon they ride and damned all those that trust them. So he's saying that they go and spread poison wherever they go and whoever listens to them. Right, yeah, so the irony is that Macbeth is listening to them and he keeps listening to them and he, so he realizes it for other people but just not for himself. That's just strange. Now, I don't really understand this part, or at least, you know, like this audio part, because the setting, if we go back and look, okay, we're on page six. Let me remember that. We're in a cavern. So we're in like a cave, but now all of a sudden, like it sounded like they were in a castle. I don't know if that was just a mistake on the audio people. I don't know, but it's just like, it sounds like he's back in his castle. But that also then begs the question, did Macbeth just like make all of this up? Are the witches even real? That's true, Banquo did see them, but I mean, they had just come back from battle. So I mean, PTSD? Or could it have been, you know, that Banquo just kind of went along with it? Yeah, I don't know. So yeah, it, it doesn't exactly like mesh, but it's just, it's just weird. So I just thought I'd point that out. All right, so let's see what Lennox has to say because Macbeth heard some galloping horses. Tis two or three, my lord, that bring you word. Macduff is fled to England. Fled to England? Aye, my good lord. Time thou anticipatest my dread exploits. The flighty purpose never is or took unless the deed go with it. From this moment the very firstlings of my heart shall be the firstlings of my hand. And even now, to crown my thoughts with acts, be it thought and done, the castle of Macduff I will surprise, seize upon a fife, give to the edge of the sword his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. No boasting like a fool, this deed I'll do before this purpose call. But no more sights. Where are these gentlemen? Come, bring me where they are. And that's the end of scene one. So Macbeth learns that Macduff has gone to England. It's like Macduff went and read Macbeth's mind, you know? <laughs> and so Macbeth vows to act on every thought immediately so that way he doesn't miss, miss out. He's just like, oh! I knew I should have killed Macduff last week. You know, like I had that thought and then no, I waited and I've missed my chance. 
And so now he's like, from this moment, the very firstlings of my heart shall be the firstlings of my hand. So firstlings are firstborns. So Macbeth is now going to go after Macduff's firstborn son, just like how he tried to do with Fleance, who is Banquo's kid. So this is supposed to go and remind the audience of um, Herod's order to kill all firstborn born sons in Judea to get rid of Jesus. So that's going to be an illusion. So a Christian illusion there too. And, you know, like some people may not know that. So that's why I wanted to go and tell you that. Um, and so then Macbeth says that he's going to go and surprise and kill all of Macduff's family. So he's going to go on into Fife and kill everybody. It's like, he's like, merging Banquo and Macduff together. And he then says that he knows that it's madness, but he won't stop to cool down. He just wants to go and cause pain and just chaos and ruin. So remember that Shakespeare is plotting Macbeth's madness. And he's the only one who sees the witches in this scene. He was the only one to go and see the dagger the night th that Duncan was killed. And he was the only one to go and see Banquo's ghost. So are these hallucinations or is it Macbeth's sick mind? You know, so that is the big question. And that is where we are going to end for today. And tomorrow, oh, tomorrow's gonna be sad because we're gonna be at the Macduff castle. And you know what's gonna happen. So prepare yourselves.